And from Psalm 42. As a heart longs for the flowing streams, so longs my soul for thee, O Lord. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me continually, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I went with the throng and led them in the profession, procession to the house of God, with glad shouts and songs of thanksgiving, with multitudes keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you so disquiet within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore I remember thee from the lands of Jordan and of Hemron to the Mount Mishar. Deep calls to deep at the thunder of thy cataracts, and all the waves by the billows have gone over me. By the day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with the deadly wound of my body, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me continually, where is thy God? Why have you cast me down, O my soul? Why have you disquieted with me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I'm sure that you have seen my, my cane here. And uh, <clears throat> in the last month, I've fallen four times. And so the doctor says I have to start uh, using a cane. I usually use the staff, but now I have to use a cane. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure that it's really helping all that much. But uh, i got to make the doctor feel better, you know. You know, one time I went to the doctor, and I said, doctor, doctor, I feel depressed. Well, I knew what I was depressed about, and I wanted to talk to the doctor about it, you know. It was something in my life that was going on. So they gave me drugs. So I don't tell the doctor I'm depressed anymore. I'm afraid of uh, getting more drugs. I'm already on enough of drugs, you know. I take a handful every morning, you know. Well, you know, what do you do when you, when you don't feel like yourself? Doctor, doctor, I don't feel like myself. Here, take these drugs. You know, it's a question that plagues a lot of us. By the way, drugs do help, okay? Uh, they tell me, that I, I take antidepressant drugs. I don't really think I need them, but the doctor says there'll come a point with this disease I have that I will definitely need antidepressant drugs. Has nothing to do with you all, okay. Anyway, it is a problem that affects all of us, whether we're young or we're older. What do I do when I don't feel like myself, you know? I want to feel normal. Most of us have gone through different phases in our life, and so often we just want to feel normal. We want the hurt to go away. We want to be, well, like we once were, I guess, hopefully, normal. You know, one phase in our life we might be bold and confident, able to take chances and criticism and all that. In another phase of our life we might be afraid or fearful or worried all the time. When we don't feel like ourselves as Christians, uh, we naturally ask, you know, what do I do about my faith? How does my faith enter into this? How do I use my faith? And that's a big question. That's why I want to talk about it a little bit this morning. The Old Testament lesson is about one of the greatest men in all the Bible. His name is Elijah, the prophet. And, uh, you know, he was a great prophet. He healed Nahum, the great military leader of his leprosy, which no one else could do. He brought a boy's life back to him and gave him back to his mother. All kind of wonderful things. You know, he could speak the words, just speak them, 
and it would not rain for three years. He, he was at the top of his game. He was the best of the best. He was really a prophet. And people came to him from all around, you know, and sought his advice. And, you know, he was on, he was on top of the mountain. I've never had that kind of spiritual power. If you come to me and ask for rain, don't do that. That's not good. Okay, it might not rain. But Elijah just defeated 400 prophets of Baal. And if you think of this, uh, it hasn't rained for three years. And they're up on top of this mountain. And Elijah kind of you know, sets up the scene. And he says, you know, you, you 400 prophets, you do your thing and get God to bring the rain. Okay? And the whole point was they had, you know, the... Uh, the gods who brought the sun and the rain and all that. And he's basically saying to them, I'm going to challenge you. My God can bring the rain. So they do that all the day till noontime. Nothing happens. Elijah has his sacrifice watered down with great big water pots. He builds a moat around it, fills it up, that sort of thing. And he goes and he prays, you know. Oh, Lord, you know. Please don't make me look bad here. <laughs> you, know, you always want to pray that too. Because <laughs> let me tell you, the Lord works in mysterious ways. I'm not always sure how it's going to work. You know? And he prays, and it's like lightning, I guess. Something like that happened. It fell down, and the Bible says it consumed everything. The water, the sacrifice, there was nothing left. There was just a hole in the ground. And then Elijah says, okay. Uh, this is a different time, all right? Let's kill these 400 prophets of Baal. I'm, I'm not going to do stuff like that, all right? Then they do that, and, and then Jezebel enters the picture. Jezebel is the queen uh, of uh, the land at that time, and she sends uh, word to him, I'm going to kill you for killing my prophets, all right? And Elijah, it says, was afraid. Now, I think when the Bible it says it like that, it is very serious about, I mean, he was quaking in his shoes, and he runs for his life. He's so distressed that he runs down to Beersheba, and he leaves his servant there. All great prophets seem to have a servant to help them with stuff. I don't know how this exactly worked, but it just seemed that way. So he leaves him. He, he doesn't want him to get killed. And he goes on into the desert. It says he uh, sat down under a broom tree. And he was so exhausted, he, you know, the angel had to come and help him. And he says these words, I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. What he says is, I want to die. <clears throat> Everybody has probably felt this way from time to time. If you've ever felt defeated by life, if you've ever felt that all your work hadn't made any difference, you're really good company because that day under the broom tree, Elijah hit rock bottom. You know, every time I go to the ALS clinic, I go to see the social worker comes. You have the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, and you have the the social worker, and then you have the psychologist person. This is really good. And one of the questions always is, have you thought about hurting yourself? That's a euphemism. And what it is is, have you thought about killing yourself? Okay? Anybody with ALS who has it badly, okay? I will have it badly someday. If they say no, they're lying. <laughs> okay? I already know this. It's funny, but we all lie to our, our doctor. Oh, no, no, I never thought about anything like that. You can't tell them that. They put you on more drugs. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, they come in and take all your guns out, take your knives out. And, oh, my, it's really awful. You can't tell them stuff like that. I'm not saying to lie to your doctor. I do, but... <laughs> It, it's, it gets very funny after a while, you know. And you, you realize what to tell them, not to tell them. Uh, one day I told them how much I weighed, you know, when I didn't have any clothes on in the bathroom. And, 
you know, got on the scale, and it was so different from theirs, it screwed everything up for three weeks. So I don't tell them anything anymore. I, ah, you weigh whatever. I'm like, oh, fine, okay, good. <laughs> I have these little devices to take my blood pressure and all that. Good. I don't tell them anything. Oh, well. Anyway, so Elijah, man, he's at rock bottom. But he's not lying to himself or to the Lord. He says, man, he says, uh, I am in a bad way. I, I have hit bottom. I just, I don't want to go on. Kill me. Well, the angel comes, feeds him. It's a nice picture. He has, you know, the, the fire and the hot coals and, and the angel was making bread and something else. And if you've ever been out in the wilderness and someone has made you food, it is a beautiful thing. Uh, I've been out with the scouts and, you know, if you crawl out of your tent in the morning and somebody is baking or whatever, oh, it's, it's wonderful. I don't even care if I don't like it or not. It's, it's great. Well, Elijah is tired of make, trying to make things happen in the religious life of his country. They are bowing down to idols and all this terrible stuff, and he is just, he is just spent. And he spends the next 40 days traveling south through the wilderness to the mountain of God, to Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, they call it. And he finds a cave, and he spends the night. We call it Elijah's cave today. So if you've ever been to the end of your rope, Elijah, well, he's right there with you. His life has come crashing down around him. And he, even though the Lord has provided, even though the Lord has allowed him to do miraculous things that no one else can do, even though he is famous, he still feels nobody cares. And that he's never going to make a difference. And he goes to the place that he thinks he can meet with God. And it's there that he finally collapses. And I suppose the other side of this question is, you know, why do I feel this way? What does the Lord want from me? You know, Rick Warren began his, his famous book, The Purpose Driven Life, which has become the most read Christian book other than the Bible in the world when it was written all oh, 15, 20 years ago. And he has this opening phrase, it's not about you. That's the first paragraph of his book, it's not about you. The purpose of our life is far greater than our own personal fulfillment, our peace of mind, even our happiness. It's far greater than our family, our career, or even as our wildest dreams or hopes or ambitions. And if you want to know why you're placed on this planet, you have to begin with God. You were born by his purpose and for his purpose. And God has important things for you to do. It may not seem important to you or that sort of thing, but they are very vitally important. And only you can do them the way God wanted them done. You know, most people don't want to hear this. And I suppose that on that day long ago, Elijah didn't want to hear it either. In fact, he tells the Lord the same thing about three times. I, I, don't th I think the Lord heard him the first time. How many times has somebody told you something many times? You go, I heard you the first time. You know, uh, I was uh, putting a window in this weekend at my daughter's house. Have you ever put a window in with, well, I don't want to say it badly, but a bunch of amateurs? <laughs> this is a straighter, that is a straight. And then finally someone goes, I will not mention her name, but uh, she goes, didn't you hear me? I go, I heard you the first time. So the Lord's kind of like, he's listening, he's got patience, you know. He's listening. And so... After Elijah sleeps in the mountain cave, the Lord speaks to him. It's very dramatic, and the Lord asks a question. This comes like three times. What are you doing here? And he addresses him, Elijah, you know. Now, 
You know that when your dad or your mom asks you, what are you doing here? This is not a good thing, you know. But the Lord listens. The Lord's patient. And he goes to this thing. I have been zealous for the Lord Almighty. They've rejected your covenant. They broke down your altars. And, you know, he's about crying. And now they want to kill me too. Elijah does not feel like his usual self. And uh, he doesn't know what to do about it. And he goes and he complains to God. You might even say he's whining a little bit. So God has Elijah go out and stand at the face of the cave and there's this huge windstorm and the rocks are even moving. They're crashing together and they're breaking. But God, Elijah says, not in the rocks. Then there is an earthquake and the ground begins to move and just shake. And, you know, mountains come down and he's not there. Then there's the fire, maybe like a volcano, but he's not there. And then there's the still whisper. And it says Elijah covers his face. Great events of nature. And the presence of the Lord is there. And then God says again in the still small voice, Elijah, what are you doing here? And of course, Elijah says the same spiel again. I'm sure he's been practicing it all 40 days that he's going down to the mountain there. <clears throat> And the Lord just simply says to him, go back the way you came. The reality was God had a lot more work for Elijah to do. If Elijah quit or if he ended his life, you know, he'd have missed so much and so many people that he was about to bless would have missed out. If Elijah was feeling lost and alone, and so... The Lord speaks to him one more thing before he leaves the mountain. He tells him and lets him know that his work is not is very important. And it's not all up to him to make this all happen. He's not the only one. And he says, Yet I reserve seven thousand in Israel, whose knees have not bowed, bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. Uh, there were these images, him you know, sort of thing. Uh, idol worship was a huge problem in Israel for a long time. It wouldn't end till after uh, uh, the people were deported to Babylon. And even then, when they came back, it had almost all ended, but there were still some shreds that held on. You know, Elijah may have felt that God had abandoned him, but God assures him, you are not alone. Your work is important. There is yet a lot to do, and you need to get up and get to it, son. I love the psalm that was read this morning, Psalm 42. It's written by the sons of Korah for worship, and that famous song begins, As the deer pants for the stream's water, so my soul pants for you, O Lord. You know, it tries to answer the question, where is God? It might have been written during the exile in Babylon. It might have been written during some terrifying time in the life of the nation of Israel. But the psalmist asks themselves, you know, it's kind of a self-question. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, probably yet praise him, my Savior and my God. He goes on to say that the waves and the breakers sometimes sweep over him. And he feels sometimes like the Lord's forgotten him. His health is failing, his bones hurt. He doesn't feel like himself. In the midst of the suffering, he says a couple things that he wants the people at worship to do who feel the same way that he does. And the first thing is to remember, always. Remember the Lord and all that he's done. And another thing is to keep a song in your heart and to pray. And lastly, put all your hope in God. Constantly praise him as Savior and God. And the psalmist probably lived through a time in life and is now looking backwards at what happened. He got through what he thought and he couldn't get through. And he realized that the hard times pass. The time of uncertainty, the time of doubt, they give way to the sunrise 
of a better day. And it is the Lord who does these things. Just like Elijah, he learned the Lord is ever present, ever listening, ever loving. And he's ever asking us to move forward where there is much to do. Let us pray. Well, Lord, we give you thanks for your constant love and your care and your concern. And may we continue forward when we don't feel like ourselves, when our health is failing, when times are tough. For we know that you're with us and there are many more like us that we're not alone ever. And we give you great thanks. And may we always have a song in our heart for you. And all God's children said, Amen.